He's a professor in the Naval Architecture Department of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering with joint department joint appointments in uh, electrical engineering and computer science and also mechanical engineering. Um, he's the director of the Perceptual Robotics Lab. And his research is on, on navigation, mapping, uh, and localization. And he has uh, won the NSF Career Award. He's an ordinary young investigator. And he's currently associate editor for three different journals, including Transactions and Robotics. And he's doing a lot of different work, including underwater robotics. But today he's going to talk about the self-driving car for Great. Okay. Well, thank you for everybody for coming today. Uh, it's it's really a treat to be here. It's my first time to be at CMU and, and to visit, and so it's been a pretty exciting day. Um, so today, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing at, at Michigan in terms of our work towards self-driving cars. Um, uh, so yeah. So as Michael mentioned at, at U of M, I direct the Perceptual Robotics Lab, and so as I like to say, in, in half of my life, uh, my robots get wet, and the other half of my life, my robots drive. Uh, I was a marine robotics guy by training. Uh, I, that's how I originally got into robotics, was wanting to work with autonomous underwater vehicles. So I used to be at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and this joint program between MIT and Woods Hole. And uh, so there, doing a lot of work you know, and actually working with Michael on applications of like underwater visual slam uh, for doing autonomous ship hole inspection and things like cooperative localization. Um, today, though, what I'm here to give you a talk about is going to be the work that we've been doing um, in collaboration with Ford Motor Company uh, in the space of automated driving. So the outline of my talk today is well, a little bit of motivation for why automated driving. I'll briefly discuss what U of M is doing as a whole in terms of its initiative with the, its new mobility transformation center that was recently launched. I'll then uh, give some detail on the next generation vehicle project that we have in collaboration with Ford Motor Company. Um, and then I think that we'll get to the fun part of the talk in terms of really just kind of have an open discussion on what are some of the critical challenges ahead and really trying to deploy some of this technology in a real world setting. And so first let's start off with you know, kind of going through why automated driving and let's touch upon safety, social, and economic. Um, so the primary one for us, uh, especially in this collaboration with Ford, this is, is coming from the safety perspective. This is growing out of the active safety group within Ford Motor Company. Active safety, you can think of like your anti-lock brakes as being a system of active safety, right? Trying to give you enough control authority to prevent the accident from happening in the first place, as opposed to passive safety, which would be like seat belts, right? Something's going to happen. How can we protect the occupant? And so when we look at statistics, you know, in the U.S. alone, right, we see we're at 5 million crashes per year. 33,000 fatalities per year. It's kind of hard to digest those numbers. What does that really mean? Well, 33,000 fatalities per year, that's like one of these happening every three days in the United States. It's like a Boeing 777 going down in terms of the number of people we're losing. And when you look worldwide, right, we have a million and a quarter fatalities per year that are happening. That's like 11 777s falling out of the sky every single day. And so when you think about it like that, you're like, wow, how can our transportation system be so unreliable? And as, as engineers, can't we do something to try to fix this? Moreover, when we look at the cause of these accidents, you know, a, a large fraction, over 90% of these, can be attributed to human error, whether it's due to speeding, drunk driving, distracted driving, everything from texting to fiddling with your radio to eating a, a Big Mac, right? Um, and so there's some hope here that through automation, we might be able to have some impact and safety, right? Uh, computers don't get distracted. Computers don't get drunk. And maybe much to the chagrin of the occupant, they might not speed, right? Um, and so, so this is one of the primary motivations for us uh, in terms of what we're trying to tackle here. But there's, also, there's more than that, too, that potentially can come through automation. So the social impact of this uh, is potentially tremendous. Um, so, you know, with the growing lifespan um, co comes a growing elderly population. So what you're seeing on this bottom left chart, this is basically showing the age distribution in Japan. On the far left, we see in 1950, we have a lot of youth and very uh, limited number of elderly people. This is what it is in the middle in 2005. And then this is the projection for 2055, right? We come top down, we have an aging population. 
Um, and so personal mobility, it's such a fundamental way that right, we interact and move about society that if you don't have access to mobility, whether it's through aging or loss of sight, um, it really cuts you off, right? Probably a number of you have probably seen this, uh, this video, and you can't watch this video and not be moved, right? So this is Steve Ahan. He's a legally blind man, right? And you can see him riding around the Google Prius going to Taco Bell, right? Or going to the laundromat and picking up his laundry. Just the everything, everyday things that we just take for granted, right? That potentially there could be huge social impact. There's also economics uh, behind this. Uh, so basically in this Forbes article, uh, econo or this Forbes uh, author and business advisor, Chunk and Wee, estimates there's about a two trillion market to be had in just the US alone, potentially. Uh, through automation. So 450 billion uh, costs annually uh, related to accidents. So that'd be all cost due to medical, uh, property damage, loss of productivity. 4.8 billion hours and over 2 billion gallons wasted annually just due to congestion. And when we think about cars, right, cars often represent a, a, per, uh, a person's second largest asset that they buy besides their home. Yet a car often sits unused 95% of the time. Right? So there's a tremendous potential there in terms of thinking about uh, pay by the mile usage schemes in terms of shared services for cars that potentially could be disruptive. As well as additional economic benefits in terms of uh, increased road network efficiency, you know, recovery lost time due to community, reduced need for parking in cities, right? If you think about cars having a much higher utilization, it could dramatically actually weigh, uh, have impact on the way we do urban planning. Um, and then also there's the why not factor, right? Who wouldn't want to commute to work like this? Um, so in addition to automation, there's also a big push in connectivity that you might have heard about. So this is talking about like vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure type communication schemes. So in some of the outline scenarios that we talked about, in particular, in think about achieving visions of you know, road network efficiency and throughput, throughput tuning or reduced headway, intersection flow. It's not just automation, but also connectivity that might play a role uh, in, in helping to achieve that. And moreover, with connectivity, it, another way I see that this might be useful is in, in basically extending our physical sensor horizons, right, beyond what we can see line of sight, but actually being able to know ahead by cars being able to relay information through the network. Here's an example of where connectivity might be able to help. Um, so this is just this past January in, uh, in Michigan, we had a 193 car pile up on Interstate I-94. So what happened here is basically we had a lake effect snow uh, blow across the highway creating blizzard-like conditions. Cars started to slow down for the conditions, right, but the cars behind were traveling too fast for the weather and were not able to see the slowing down traffic in front of it. At the end of the day, 193 cars were involved uh, in this accident. There were uh, over 30 people injured and actually one person died as a result of this. So this is an area where through connectivity, right, beyond actual physical line of sight, if this information could have been relayed through the network, it might have had some potential for helping to mitigate situations like this. So now let me briefly talk a little bit about what the University U of M doing, is doing as a whole in the area of connected and automated driving with its creation of the new Mobility Transformation Center, or MTC as it's called. So MTC is a public-private R&D partnership in mobility, um, basically focused on developing the foundations for a commercially viable ecosystem of connected and automated vehicles. Um, it's comprised of, we have 14 founding leadership circle partner companies are working with, so the traditional OEMs like Ford and GM, Toyota, um, but as well as non-traditional companies like Verizon, State Farm Insurance, um, Xerox, um, as well as the 30 other affiliate companies that are involved with this. And so what, they're, what, what these uh, companies are buying into is basically um, through their membership fee, they're allowed to do pooled research projects uh, at the university where everybody has access to the results of that type of research in connectivity and automation. And really the three aspects that MTC is really trying to push in terms of success is one, the partnership between uh, industry, academia, national, state, and local governments. Deployment and testing is a big part of MTC, so both on roadway settings in Ann Arbor and Southeast Michigan, as well as we have a new purpose-built facility called M-City that I'll talk about at U of M. And then it's really an interdisciplinary approach. So this not only pulls in the College of Engineering at the university, but also pulls in um, our U of M Transportation Research Institute, our uh, public policy, urban planning, 
legal, right? All the things that are going to come into, it's not just the technology, but it's also the other uh, disruptive aspects of all this in terms of liability and, and, and social change. And so the goal of MTC then is really to develop this basically this entire uh, ecosystem of connected automated transportations uh, and have Ann Arbor be basically this sandbox, this, this, uh, this uh, playground for really um, trying to do a proof of concept deployment and demonstration of connected automated vehicles in southeastern Michigan. So this, re this represents about a shared investment of $100 million over eight years with the university itself putting in a quarter of that um, toward this goal. And so, like as I said, it pulls in, you know, not only College of Engineering and U of M Transportation Research Institute, those are the two that are highlighted in yellow. Those are some of the big players in this. But it, all the different uh, uh, units as well um, that are related to this, like law and school business and urban planning. And the three major pilot projects, uh, they call them pillar projects, that are, are part of MTC. One is a connected Ann Arbor, so this builds upon uh, UMTREE, the U of M Transportation Research Institute, it has an existing safety pilot study that it did with the US DOT to have 3,000 cars in Ann Arbor instrumented with these DSRC shortwave radios for doing the V to V and V to I infrastructure, as well as the number of intersections in Ann Arbor that were instrumented. Pillar one basically scales that up to about 9,000 cars uh, within Ann Arbor equipped with DSRC radios, as well as a majority of the intersections within Ann Arbor being instrumented with the infrastructure side. A connected Southeast Michigan, so now we're talking about 20,000 equipped cars, and this is basically working with our OEM partners like Ford and General Motors, and basically tapping into their fleet vehicles that they have to instrument them, and then we have a corridor of I-94 and some of the other existing highways uh, around that area where we can deploy the infrastructure side of this. And then automated Ann Arbor uh, concept, uh, which is basically a, uh, a stretch goal of having you know, 2,000 connected automated vehicles by 2021 uh, within the vicinity of Ann Arbor. And anchoring all these pillar projects is M-City. And this is a unique new test facility purpose-built for safe off-roadway testing and connected automated vehicles uh, on the campus of University of Michigan. So this is a new uh, facility, just grand opening was this past July. It represents a six and a half million dollar investment shared between uh, three million of that coming from uh, the Michigan Department of Transportation, the rest of that coming from the university itself. But it's actually more than that. That's the six and a half million in direct costs. We also have, it's really about 11 million when you consider in-kind contributions from a lot of people in terms of a lot of the traffic light infrastructure and everything that goes into this. And if you consider the land, in, in addition to this, this is really about a $25 million plus facility that, that was just created. So M-City is a new 32 acre, five mile network of roads. Uh, and uh, I was on the design committee for M-City. The basic premise is we asked for one of everything. Uh, we want M-City to, to really be a mock urban environment. So not only do we have a five lane uh, stretch of highway with on and off ramps, but we also have a downtown area where there's actually fake building facades there, intersections that we get to write code and control the phase on for these guys. Uh, a tunnel that we have to drive through for GPS denial. Uh, all this basically uh, urban environment. Um, and as I'll talk about this a little bit later, but basically the idea behind M City is we get to be maximally evil to the technology uh, within MC. This is not a replacement for on-road testing. This is a supplement to on-road testing. It allows us to do some statistical meaningful miles here in terms of hard miles. And best of all, M-City is right on campus. So there you can see where M-City is. If you look at Google Maps, you can see it now. Here's the, where the College of Engineering is. Uh, this is where the U of M Transportation Research Institute is. And actually, we're building a new robotics institute at U of M. So uh, there'll be another uh, RI eventually. Um, and uh, so you can see, basically, it's right on campus, right? It's about a, less than a mile or a kilometer from my office. So now I've briefly talked about um, what U of M is doing as a whole in the space. Let me give you an overview of what I'm doing in terms of automated driving in collaboration with Ford Motor Company. So the next generation vehicle project represents a collaboration between Ford Motor Company and the University of Michigan via the Ford U of M Alliance. Ford has a number of alliances with different universities, MIT, Stanford being two other ones, uh, the University of Michigan uh, being another partner school that it has an alliance with. And uh, so this project is led uh, at U of M by myself and my colleague Ed Olson in computer science, and Jim McBride's the technical lead within Ford Motor Company uh, on this project. And this project is really an outgrowth of you know, the DARPA Urban Challenge and Grand Challenge events. So nearly 10 year, years ago, right, DARPA basically um, formed these Grand Challenge events and the Urban Challenge, and they provided an early glimpse right, into a transitioning robotics from the lab to the real world in terms of 
driving. Um, Ford uh, competed actually in the Desert Challenge as well as in the, in the 2007 Urban Challenge. There were finalists in both of those. Ford didn't wave the flag and say that they were Ford in either of those contests. They ran under different pseudonyms and names, so you didn't really know that it was Ford that was there. Um, I collaborated in, with uh, Ford's team on the 07 Urban Challenge, and then my colleague Ed Olson was at MIT working with John Leonard at the time on MIT's entry in, in the Urban Challenge. And actually, a little known secret about then is we were actually collaborating together then as two teams. So we were actually running off of largely one similar code base back then uh, between us. This then led to, via the Ford Demo Alliance, having uh, subsequent projects uh, with Ford Motor Company in the space, which has ultimately led to this uh, 2014 Ford Fusion Hybrid that I'll talk about today, which is the NGV project. So here it is. Uh, here you can see the vehicle. Um, and the most conspicuous thing you'll see about it on the roof is those antlers, right? So it, we've got an array of four Velodyne 32s on the roof. Um, and part of the reason for wanting to work with an array of LiDARs now is that we think as we go towards production intent, that as these sensors get smaller and cheaper, we're going to be able to uh, more aesthetically pleasing ways embed them into the car and we're going to need uh, we're going to basically get the kind of coverage we need right by having arrays of these lidars embedded around the car um, by working with these off-the-shelf lidars now it allows us to actually have some degree of freedom in terms of designing the beam geometry so when we look at the array we'll, I'll show you some of the beam patterns that we get out of this we're actually able to control the density of where we get coverage with this. Um, and it forces us to deal with some of the technical challenges now, like sensor calibration, right? How we do the extrinsics and keep these guys aligned. How we deal with the asynchronous data rates from, from this suite of sensors. So we have about two million data points or so per second are coming in uh, with that array. Now, at least you think that this, kid's only car, this car is only good for a Sunday drive. Let me squash that notion right now. So this is, the, this is our vehicle under full autonomy control doing a racing line around Ford steering and handling crewing course at Ford. So the racing line that the car is executing right now, um, it's a race line down the track where basically it's either trying to hit limits of the track speed, so in this case we said 60 miles per hour, or lateral acceleration, in this case six tenths of a G that we're trying to pull around the track. If we go much faster than that, we'll go airborne. Um, and so you can just see the, the drive-by-wire integration with this, and actually, the, as we'll see in a second, how this hands off, basically the smooth interface between the human being able to grab the wheel and basically uh, take back control of the system. So by working with the Ford engineers on, on this car, right, we're, we tap into the vehicle dynamics, we tap into the control, they open up the black box for us. So this car really in its DNA is, knows that it's an autonomous car. So now let me kind of hit upon some of the points about what makes all this work. So as I said, we're starting from the 2014 Ford Fusion uh, Hybrid, which from Ford's perspective, this represents their most current electrical architecture to build off of. So it's got legs to come in terms of some of the, their production um, design uh, for the next several years. So it provides a good substrate, basically, for production intent autonomy development. Now, as you can see, this car already comes with a lot of the types of uh, driver convenience features that you would see on, on some of these higher-end or vehicles that you can buy now, like lane keep assist, adaptive cruise control, driver alert systems. Um, and then we take that vehicle and then we add additional sensing and computation to it. So the four Velodyne 32 LiDARs that I mentioned, uh, we have production experimental versions of Delphi radars for 360 radar coverage around the vehicle. You know, machine vision cameras, different configurations of those. Uh, we have an Aplonix uh, uh, INS system in this car. And then for compute, we have five nodes, basically quad-core i7 computation. Um, and the thought being there is we're, as we're writing uh, research and development code, right, we would rather be able to throw more cores at it than writing highly optimized code at this point in time. So we're trying to demonstrate functionality at this point. Um, so what that configuration provides us is basically GPS gives us a course measure of the vehicle's position, but then one, largely speaking, the LIDARs provide two main purposes for us. Not only do they serve uh, obstacle detection, pedestrian tracking, and whatnot, but they also provide localization for us. And I'll talk about what that means in terms of how we leverage 3D prior maps and localize into them. Uh, the cam optical camera systems then, right, those help read traffic light signals in terms of what the phase is, in terms of red, green, yellow, but as, as well provide additional sensing cues for um, understanding the scene and, and objects in, in it. Uh, the forward radars uh, basically measure speed and range to the vehicles around us, you know, our IMU and orientation sensors, 
attitude and balance, wheel odometry, right, to give us uh, basically uh, local motion in terms of uh, our local frame of motion in terms of distance traveled, and then finally the compute, which is taking in all this data and um, assimilating it and then regulating the vehicle behavior. So if you look at our, our sensor payload, right, the traditional kind of sensor payload would be to have like a, maybe like a single 64 on the roof, and in fact, this is the kind of configuration we had back in the DARPA Grand Challenge days. The problem with a single sensor kind of configuration, one, you get blind spots, you get self-occlusion from your own uh, body outline of the vehicle itself, so you can see that shadow zone around the vehicle, as well as it doesn't provide any measure of redundancy or, uh, in the system. If that sensor goes down, we lose that modality of coverage. So what we opted for um, on this project was really to start looking, working with arrays of LIDARs, thinking that this is the way it's going to go from an ultimate deployment standpoint. So we traded that 164 for 432s. This gives you a view of kind of what that beam pattern looks like for the vehicle by having an array of 32s on the roof, and then in fact how we cant them on the roof, right? We have them set up such that we actually get lasers sweeping through space from different directions, and we can actually control the phase of how the LIDARs are relative to each other so that we can sweep through this, the space either simultaneously or have them be 180 degrees out of phase. Um, so it gives us uh, redundancy, so it gives us more reliability. We get multiple looks at a single point in space from a single pose, so it gives us more information in terms of trying to do uh, reasoning about the objects and, and, and tracking. And like I said, it also gives us then control over actually some flexibility in using these off-the-shelf sensors and trying to design the beam pattern, if you will. Um, and so, and as these sensors get cheaper, better, smaller, right? So here you can see the progression of 64 down to the Veldine 16. It's going to become more feasible to embed these guys into the body, right? So they'll look more aesthetically pleasing. But to get the kind of coverage you need, you're going to have to fundamentally deal with arrays of these LIDARs. And so we wanted to work with these guys now so that we start to really think about some of the technical challenges we need to solve with this kind of mindset. So if we look at what those uh, array provides us, on the left you're seeing what any single LIDAR in our configuration would see. And on the right, you're looking at the fused result of all four LIDARs in terms of the aggregated point cloud that we get. Um, and so you can see that uh, by getting multiple intersecting looks, you can see that kind of rich cross-hatching beam pattern coverage that we get with the array of LIDARs on the right. So we get an overall denser sensing field of view immediately uh, in front of the, of the vehicle as well as behind it with this sweeping configuration. Now, it doesn't come with its own set of problems as well. Um, so, for instance, if we look at calibration, calibration becomes something we're very concerned with, right? You know, uh, by working with arrays of LIDARs, we have to worry about the extrinsic and the intrinsic calibration between these LIDARs. So, it's not only the range geometry that we get from these, but also, as I'll show you, surface reflectivity information is really useful. By, if you just take these guys off the shelf, if you try to mash up the reflectivity information, you'll just get this gray smear, okay? They're not really well calibrated relative to each other. So as opposed to one big sensor, if we get the extrinsics wrong, what happens is that would just kind of shift our whole pose in the world if we're trying to localize into a map. Here, if we have extrinsic error between the array of LIDARs, you can see quickly we get a fuzzy picture of the world that's going on. So here we're just showing the small perturbations of less than a degree in terms of relative attitude between these LIDARs. You can see quickly how we can get things to come out of focus. And so fundamentally, in terms of the way we think about our SLAM map building that we do offline, they'll talk about calibrations built into that in terms of trying to estimate that, as well as in our online localization algorithms, continuously trying to self-calibrate these sensors. And so our basic architecture, like many others that are uh, playing in the space, we leverage 3D prior maps, um, which we'll, we'll spend some time on talking about why this, why this is. So our basic architecture is that 3D prior maps, those play into our ability to localize into those maps. Those play into our ability to use the actual sensing cues from the sens raw sensor modality in terms of trying to reason about, what the, envi about the environment, what we're seeing, um, which then feeds into our planning and control. So let's see what those LIDARs are actually seeing now. This is what I mean by a 3D prior map. So we pre-drive the environment under human control, okay? We basically collect a data log, which then we do an offline SLAM optimization to make this a metrically, metrically consistent map, okay? And here you can see that the blues then represent that prior map. So this is downtown Ann Arbor. The reds and yellows, this is what we sense in real time from that LIDAR array. So we're localized to a 10 centimeter accuracy in this 
global map at any given time, GPS free, using the LiDAR modality. And in addition, then we're also then picking out the, as you can see, the different traffic and the obstacles and pedestrians in the environment, differentiating that from the background information that might be contained uh, within the map. And so again, here again, you can see the kind of rich coverage that we get with this LiDAR configuration in terms of how the, we get this kind of cross-hatching pattern. Now this information then, in terms of how we use these maps, it feeds into a number of different aspects of our, of our algorithm. So for instance, if we look at sensing and tracking, this is the, this is the Ford steering and handling course that uh, uh, is at Ford Motor Company. This is the one I showed you where we're doing that, 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 uh, that fast driving right around the racetrack. This is a highly three-dimensional track, in fact. It has a lot of blind curves and a lot of undulating structure. So you can see in the, in the ground plane, this is the raw LiDAR beam coverage that you're seeing there. Our car's in the middle. We're tracking the lead and the, and the chase car behind us. You can see now as that car goes in front, it just disappeared from our field of view. Why? It's occluded, right? So if we don't have pixels on it or, or rays on it from the LiDAR, right, we can't see it. I think this is an area where V to V could play well with the stuff that we're trying to do. So V to V is the vehicle to vehicle communication aspect. You can imagine the cars are relaying information back through the network. It can extend your virtual sensor horizon so you have some idea what might be up ahead even though you can't physically see it. Question? Yeah. Isn't that the same kind of assumption that sunk the previous version of driverless cars that we would re-engineer our roads to make them work? Now you're saying every single vehicle has to be no, I am not. So I'm saying this is a, I'm, I'm, I am not an advocate for V to V. I try to play nice with people that want to do V to V, and I say, I throw them a bone here, and I say, this is where it could be complementary to what we want to do. What we're trying to fundamentally do in this project, we don't have any V to V or V to I in our system. So we're trying to make the car itself intelligent. So we're, we're very much pushing on the end of the spectrum of trying to add computation and sensing to this car to, 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 to push it as far as we can in terms of trying to drive on existing infrastructure and existing road networks. Um, so this is just more of, of uh, yeah, I guess uh, 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 in this, because there's really two big camps out there, right? There's the V to V camp and V to I camp, and then there's kind of like the automated driving camp where I'm gonna just instrument the car and try to make it smart. I think both those communities right now are kind of pushing in their individual directions. And I think this is a point where maybe there's some room, right, for how they could kind of merge together ultimately. Um, and so that's, that's how I think about this, I guess. Um, and then so what you're seeing here is then all this information that feeds into our planning and control. So these are just a few of the kinematically feasible trajectories that are being considered by the vehicle at every instant using a model predictive control framework um, where each possible trajectory you know, is being scored for its ability for safety in terms of staying on the road, avoid obstacles, ride comfort, and whatnot. So now, let's go back and look at this architecture and kind of revisit this premise of why these 3D prior maps exist at all in the first place. And so the question is, why precision mapping, right? You or I as humans, right, we don't need centimeter scale maps to drive, right? Um, why should cars? And the problem is, is that, real, you know, right now, we're currently beyond the state of art to be able to decode and parse road scenes in real time with the re level of reliability and accuracy that we need to be able to handle um, a lot of these corner cases that come up. And so the approach that we're taking here is to try to expect the expected and reason about what's different. So we try to bake in as much as the weird and the wacky as we can into our prior knowledge about the environment. So here this is a, a sculpture in, in Poland, right? To a, a LiDAR, this would look like people, okay? Here's the crazy intersection that you need to parse in terms of what lane maps up with which other lane, right, in terms of thinking about my, my planning. And so we, by trading perception somewhat for a localization problem, we've created this artificial problem. To, to access the spatial database of these 3D prior maps that we need, I need to know precisely where I am in them, right? So we create this artificial localization problem. Although there's a lot of machinery and robotics right in the past couple decades that have been developed that we can bring to bear in trying to solve that localization problem. And so again, the, the mindset here is expect the expected and then reason about what's different, recognizing that roadways are a fairly controlled environment. I mean, things do change, don't get me wrong. Construction happens, right? It's not that we can't drive novel roads, it's that if we want to drive novel roads and try to put as many nines as we can in terms of reliability on 99.9, .9, you name it, right? 
3D prior maps right now present one way that where we can try from an engineering approach, try to add more robustness to the system. So what is, what's the price we pay? Well, before we drive, we have to do this, right? We, we need to pre-drive, collect data, build these 3D prior maps. We try to encode as many, much semantics about the environment into these maps ahead of time, right? Um, so we're encoding road geometry. We're encoding information about uh, the information about stoplights and, and things like that into this, into this map. Um, and we try to do as much as, as we can automated, right? Uh, at the end of the day, there's still a human, though, that's really doing a lot of quality control on the information that's being embedded and going into these maps. So the second aspect of this is that in terms of the mapping, we basically t use our vehicle to drive through the environment. We use a post graph slam framework where we're using the odometry information that we have. You can see there was some misalignment there. It just got corrected by doing scan registration between overlapping point clouds collected at different points in time, but from the physically the same area. And then we're then able to optimize the vehicle's trajectory through, through time to have an optimized pose. Um, and so what this then serves as the basis for us is with an optimized pose graph, we can then accumulate the laser scans and reproject them back into space and produce these beautiful crisp kind of point clouds that you see here that not only have the geometry of the scene, but as you can see in the ground plane, right, that's all the road reflectivity information that's been picked up and sensed by the LiDAR itself, right? So all the road paint and all the tar strips and everything that's in the ground plane has been sensed um, by the LiDAR modality. And so then the way we use these is once we have these 3D prior maps in the real-time driving application, here you can see these are two stoplights I can't even see. They're occluded by that bus. But yeah, I know where to, I expect them to be in space, right, by knowing where I am in the map. And so it makes an extraction of these uh, more robust because I have a good region of interest of where I need to look, okay, in the map to try to extract those, those, those uh, signals. As well as when it comes to sensing and tracking, these prior maps then add additional robustness in our ability to sense and track other objects on the road. So in this case, we can use the information about the road topology to track, actually predict and, and forecast what we think other user agents and tents are going to be through time uh, by giving information about the road network. As well as with these 3D prior maps, if we have certain sensor modalities that repeatedly cause false alarms, like radar is notorious for giving you uh, false returns right off like guardrails or things like that, we can embed that information into the map. Right? If it, if, it, if it occurs in a repeatable way, we can try to encode some of that information in the map, as well as even using the 3D ground plane information, we can extract more signal in terms of trying to differentiate objects, maybe like clutter or, or you know, blown out tire carcasses on the road from what we know to be the actual road. So now let me uh, spend a little bit of time and just talk about some recent highlights, more from the research end. I've talked to you a lot about the engineering that goes into fielding a system like this. First thing I want to talk about is uh, some work with my PhD students, uh, Ryan Wilcott, in terms of visual localization within 3D prior maps obtained from LiDAR. And so the idea here is that this is the predominant uh, methodology that we use nowadays is that we have these 3D prior maps. We then use that same modality, LiDAR, to localize back into them. In this case, what you're seeing is a depiction of the local accumulation of information that's obtained in the ground plane from the, from the LiDAR. And then we're trying to essentially scan match the information back into the ground plane information that might be resident in the 3D prior map. And so you can see that here. And the question that we asked was this. Given a 3D prior map and given a forward-looking optical camera system, what can I do? Can I achieve some of that localization functionality through an optical camera? So what you're seeing here on the right, this is a prediction of what we think an optical, or what, what the projective geometry would say, what the scene should look like according to, if we have a hypothesis of where we are in a 3D prior map, we think this is what we should see. This is what we actually see from a forward-looking camera in a Bayesian estimation framework. This now serves as the observation, the correction that allows us to observe error and drift in our pose. So the way we frame this problem is that we're going to look at uh, basically a statistical measure of the similarity between what we get from that, uh, the LiDAR reflectivity information and then the grayscale pixel intensity information. We use a mutual information framework here to look at basically uh, the similarity between those two different modalities, which fundamentally don't measure the same thing. So you don't have a monotonic mapping from pixel intensity to LiDAR. In fact, LiDAR is active lighting, right? It, it doesn't matter if you, if you take a LiDAR map in the day or at night, you get the same reflectivity value, whereas with the camera, depending on ambient illumination conditions and whatnot, the pixel intensities you get can actually be very different. And so the basic intuition that you have here is that under what you're looking at is this is the joint distribution of LiDAR reflectivity 
and camera pixel intensity. That joint distribution has the most tight structure, right? The most kind of statistical correlation when we have the right pose. So what you're seeing here is as we look, we're just sweeping through and kind of visualizing different uh, translations, right? That might be considered between our pose, where we think we are on the map, and what we actually see. You can see the, the, the spread that we get in that joint histogram. And under the right transform, we see that that joint histogram basically has the least amount of entropy associated with it. So now we can use this uh, for localization in the sense that we're going to turn this into a search problem. Given an initial guess of where we think we might be in our map, we're going to search over x, y, and theta. Where for the different x, y, those basically correspond to different x, y guesses where we're on the map. We basically use OpenGL and render a synthetic image of what we think the world should look like according to our 3D prior map. This would be the projective view. To consider the different cases of orientation, then we then apply uh, a synthetic warp using the infinite homography to basically look at what would the image look like from different slight orientation uh, deviations from that view. And now we can basically do a brute force search where we search over the space of x, y translations and then each one of these squares represents a different orientation guess in theta. And then we're looking basically for the uh, maximum in terms of the normalized mutual information score that we get out of that. We then were able to value this relatively quickly. We're at 10,000 poses per second. So to give you an idea, this is like, you know, maybe about 10 frames per second we're able to do in terms of frame rate with this. Um, and so what you'll see here, this is going to be a, a depiction showing uh, the vehicle actually localized. So on the left, we're going to see a bird's eye view of where the vehicle is in the map. The top here, those would be the cost surfaces, the different slices. Each slice there represents a different orientation. And then within there, the different x, y. And what you see here is a blended overlay of the synthetic view and the actual optical camera view. The thing to notice is just look how tightly those two guys are registered against each other in overlay, which speaks to our, our accuracy in terms of what, how we're able to localize into these prior maps using a camera and wheel odometry, essentially. Right? Now, I'm not saying that we would replace the LiDAR and throw it away, but this gives us, in terms of a design space, this gives us a new degree of freedom. Do I need all those LiDAR beams to serve purely the localization purpose, or can I repurpose some of them, maybe for obstacle detection, knowing that I can supplement some of my localization capability from the optical camera system? And as you can see, right, uh, we're pretty robust to, obviously, in the live view, we see cars and other things that are not resident in the 3D prior map in the background. Now, another thing that uh, we've been working on in terms of the localization with these maps is uh, dealing with this. So especially in Michigan, right, it's like this quite a few months out of the year. And so we just try to localize in the ground plane alone. After a snow cover setting, right, you'd be out of luck. So the question here is how do we exploit 3D geometry that we have uh, in these 3D prior maps, but to do it in a computationally efficient way. Um, so what you're seeing here is that on a good weather day, this would be a nice uh, reflectivity map that we would get at the intersection. This is that same intersection, though, under poor weather conditions, right? We get basically a very low signal to noise um, uh, signal to come back. And so the idea is here, how can we use the 3D structure of the environment itself to help us with this? And so here we're using what we call Gaussian mixture maps. Basically, this is a 2.5D representation of the environment. Each cell represents a z-height distribution. We're going to use Nominally, we'll use a, a couple Gaussians to represent that z-height distribution. So nominally, what you'll find is you'll get one distribution that will represent maybe where the ground plane is, and then another distribution that will represent the extent of the vertical kind of z-height distribution due to the vertical structure. It gives us relatively compact representation. We need about 30 megabytes per linear kilometer with this representation. And uh, another key aspect of this is, is basically how we're able to use this information in a multi-resolution approach to quickly do a branch and brown search framework to uh, do, a, do a global search, but with only exploring a small number of the different configurations. So what you can see here is, as we pan through, this is giving you the Gaussian distribution that you'd see in any individual cell. So as we go over, this would be the ground plane. As we sweep over something that has vertical structure, you'll see that second Gaussian kind of represent then the expanse, right, of the z-height distribution. Now, we can do this at different spatial resolutions. So each of these cells here, what you're seeing is the z-height distribution at a larger multi-resolution uh, scale within these maps. The way we can use this then is in a multi-resolution search, let me get this to flip to the next slide, 
On the upper left, that'd be a brute force search where we're going to search over x, y, theta for all these different poses and try to find the optimal alignment. Here, each, each level here represents a, a different resolution. This is becoming a finer and finer resolution. So we're able to do a coarse search at a, at a lower resolution in a branch and bound framework that quickly allows us to find the exact same global minima that the exhaustive search finds, but yet we're able to do it by only exploring about 1% of the configuration space that the exhaustive search is, is trying to explore. And the point to be taken here is this is just basically showing uh, a measure of kind of like our ability to register these scans into the map. On the left would be a histogram of kind of the errors that we would get under a good weather condition. And on the right would be under poor weather. And the point to be made here is that those distributions look largely speaking the same. Okay, so that this, this system works pretty well even in uh, snow-covered kind of landscapes. Now, let me just skip ahead a little bit because I want to keep us on time. So let me pick up right here. So in the final portion of my talk, let me now talk about what I think are some of the critical challenges ahead in really trying to field some of this technology. So there's lots of questions for self-driving cars. There's a lot of adoption challenges, right, from the technical to economic, legal, especially in the U.S., right? Who's, who am I going to sue? Um, security, right? Basically, there's a lot of new surface area now here in terms of hacking and cyber attacks with these systems, from even to physically hacking the sensors themselves, right? There was, I, I saw a Wired article not too long ago about a guy being able to basically spoof a laser sensor, right? Um, to technical challenges, right? So how do we maintain these maps, right? How do we deal with adverse weather? Interacting with people, especially if we're going to be on mixed infrastructure, right? What's the social dance of driving? Um, so let me just focus on a couple of these. The first one is perception. So I know John was here last year, uh, last academic year, and gave a talk on this. So John uh, Leonard at MIT has been a vocal critic or a vocal voice of reason, I would say, in terms of really trying to be, bring some rational thinking to the conversation in terms of where are we really at with self-driving cars, right? John being John, uh, he basically bought a dash cam for his car and drove around Boston for six months just collecting snippets of the everyday driving that you would find, right, and then collecting those together to basically emphasize his point. Everything from like all weather driving, right? So in this case, if you have a snow covered road, especially if you live in the Northeast, what do you do on a snow covered road? Do you drive in what you know to be the lane, right? The actual lane of your road, or do you drive the tire tracks to the guy in front of you? To paving overnight, right? Can dramatically change these maps to these other couple points that we'll see. The social dance of driving. Here we're trying to make a left hand turn in Boston. Look at all the packages. So, so that social dance, right? Making eye contact with people at a four-way stop. That's a lot of the grease and in in, that really makes things happen, right? What does it mean for a robot to try to interact with you, right? And just kind of show its intent. How do, we, how do we capture the importance of that social interaction in driving? Uh, I gave this talk at uh, the IEEE Vehicle Symposium this summer. And Chris Garrity's from Stanford said, well, you won't need to deal with that. You always just make right-hand turns. <laughs> So maybe, maybe that's your solution strategy. Um, it is true you're kind of overstating it. I can't see people in most tinted windows. I haven't seen a driver of a car in I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe, that's, maybe that's out here in Pittsburgh. I don't know. I, I, I usually make eye contact. People are like, it's even like flashing lights. Or usually even a simple thing like this, waving. In Boston, it's this. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> But so the point is, I mean, I think there is some social interaction, though. What, if, is it going to be that the humans are always going to cut the, car off, the robot off and never let it go? I don't know. But yeah, giving it the middle finger is definitely social interaction. Um, another, another one, you know, does green always mean go? So here it's a red light. If you notice, the cop's waving us through. We're going to drive up. You're going to see it's another, uh, in this case, green light. But watch what happens. 
right there. Hand up, just steps on the traffic. Everybody knows what to do, and they stop, right? Green light. So the T subway just got out, and they want to facilitate traffic flow. Now, it's not beyond reason to think that we can't write a computer vision algorithm that recognizes somebody going like this. The point is, do you want your car to stop every time some teenager just goes out there and, and does this? <laughs> it's all that top-down reasoning, right, of understanding the scene and the environment, knowing this is a real situation, right? I should stop, okay? That's hard. We're not at that. I, I think this is still a fundamentally a hard problem for us to be able to solve. Um, another one is human factors. So let me set this up. How many of you guys have ever watched M MTV's Jackass? This is, a, this is a show where it's based upon the fundamental premise is that they get a couple of knuckleheads that do a stupid stunt every week. They film it, and it's entertainment. So in this case, they're going to go on safari. When most people go on safari, they like to hide in jeeps. Those people are idiots. We're hiding in a zebra suit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so obviously that's a bad idea, right? <laughs> so what I like to argue is, is socially, so is mostly autonomous. So it's often suggested that self-driving cars will do driving most of the time, and that humans will intervene as necessary. And in fact, when you look at the different levels that, like NHTSA defines these zero through four levels of autonomy, level three, basically the, the car is able to drive most of the time, but the human is there as a fallback. The problem is that this is a human factors problem, okay? So on this axis, we can think about mean time between interventions. When do I need to grab the wheel? On the far left, we can think about cruise control plus lane keep assist, okay? Maybe that's in the order of seconds, okay? Or maybe better than that, but when this gets to infinity, I'm fine with putting my kids in the car and letting it drive them to school. Now we can argue about where self-driving cars are, right? In, on this axis, whether it's minutes, hours, or days. The problem is that anywhere in here, is no man's land for automated cars. And the reason being is that humans cannot be trusted to intervene at low, low duty cycles, okay? It takes time for a human to engage and understand their surroundings, okay? To, to plug back into the system. So a car basically has to be able to predict several moments into the future before it's gonna give up control to you, right? There was a study that came out of Stanford this summer where they basically did the study in a virtual driving simulator and what they found is that in the first 10 seconds of a human trying to take back control of an automated car, they're as good as a drunk driver. <laughs> it takes a full 60 seconds for them to gain the cognitive capability of an attentive and engaged driver. We all saw what happened uh, probably a couple weeks ago. Tesla did a push, right, of its autopilot. Here's what you need to do. This is why you need to be an attentive driver. Watch. It's going to kick out here. This video, if you Google on YouTube, is called My Tesla Tried to Kill Me. <laughs> okay? Now, this is the expectation of the level three system. The problem is, what does the general public think the expectation, the capability is? It's this. <laughs> Who has seen these videos on YouTube? A guy with a newspaper, a guy jumping in the back seat of this car, this makeup stunt that they're doing here. They're going to be doing makeup with actual other occupants in the back seat, risking their lives, not just the drivers, their lives as well. <laughs> the problem is, the public and the people place way too much trust in what the system's capable of, okay? And in fact, it's worse than inattention, right? What does it mean if your car fails every third Tuesday and you have to intervene? How practice of a driver are you going to be? The reason we're such good drivers right now, we can talk about one fatality per 100 million miles, it's because we're driving all the time. I'm always practicing, right? I have that kinesthetic feel for what it means to drive. If my car is failing every third Tuesday, I don't have that feel anymore. What does it mean to grow up to be a teenager and be the driver behind the wheel of a car and learn to drive when the car drives for 98% of the time? And in fact, the airline industry already has this problem. Planes are already highly automated systems, right? Let's look at a couple case studies. Here we have flight uh, Air France uh, uh, 447. This was a flight from Rio de Janeiro to Paris, uh, 2009. And uh, it's filmed by, or basically flown by a captain, two first officers, 220 people on board. And as we all know, that plane went down and everybody died. Now in the aftermath, and when they were able to recover the black boxes, what they learned 
is that the root cause of the, of the problem was that basically the pitot tubes, that's these guys on the outside of the airplane, if you, next time you're on an airplane, pay attention, you'll see these things. Right, these are measure, basically measuring airspeed, okay? Those pitot tubes, all three of them froze up on the, on the, on the, on the Airbus system. So what happens? The automation kicks out. It says, go back to human control. What happened? The humans failed to interpret the situation and recognized it wrongly. They basically put the thing into a full thrust, did a, did a hard climb angle on this. They achieved an angle of attack of about 40 degrees relative to the wind, and were in a stall configuration that they never failed to recognize. And they basically just literally fell out of the sky for three minutes, plummeting into the ocean. Okay? Now, they're actually trained for this. Here's the Air France flight manual. Unreliable airspeed indicator. What you're supposed to do is to put the thing at about three quarters thrust and maintain a pitch angle less than five degrees so that you never get anywhere near stall configuration. They failed to recognize this. They're highly trained for this particular scenario, right? But the plane's flying most of the time. When do they ever get to do this, okay? And it's not, no way practical to think about training your Tesla. I don't even know what the Tesla owner manuals was look, looked like when they woke up and all of a sudden they said automated driving. What, what training did they have? So the point is, keeping a human at practice ready and engaged in a highly automated system is, is really hard, right? But it's more than that. So here's another case study. This is a Qantas flight uh, 72, again an Airbus A330. Um, this was on a flight from Singapore to Perth in October 2008. And what happened is basically the plane made uh, two uh, uncommanded, very severe pitch down uh, nose dives. This is from bodies flying up and hitting the roof of the cabin. Okay? There were 315 people on board, but 115 people were really severely injured, including fractures, lacerations, and spinal injuries from this. Now in the aftermath of this one, what they were able to understand. So the plane was able to safely land. The pilots basically kicked out any of the automation and, and flew it back under manual control and then landed, did an emergency landing. In the failure analysis, uh, what they found is that, you know, in, in these airlines, they try to build these highly redundant, reliable systems. So in fact, they talk about triplicates, things in threes, like IMUs, they come in threes. And the basic algorithm is that if all IMUs agree, I take the average of the first two, okay? There was a particular very weird hardware-software co combination bug that they never, hardly ever experienced where one of the IMUs got into a wonky, weird state and was injecting bad data in the system and the algorithm did not filter it, didn't recognize it. So what the plane actually thought it was doing is it thought it was in a stall configuration. What do you do when you have stall? You need to, you need to do a nosedive and pick up wing speed so that you can recover from that. That's why the automation software is doing these hard pitch down events. The thing is, this particular software-hardware combination bug, it's only happened three times in 128 million hours of operation. To put 128 million hours into an adjustable number for you, that's three times in 14,600 years of operation. Right? So the point is, building a reliable autonomous system is very hard, even in relatively high budget vehicles. Moreover, when we look at this complexity, Here's the software complexing of a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, about six and a half million lines of code. Here's your average Ford, 10 million lines of code. And when we talk about adding automation, a lot of these convenience features that we're adding to this, we can see that we're quickly on this exponential curve of complexity that's happening. So what do we do? So hopefully I've shed some light on you that I, you could, you, that uh, this notion of mostly autonomous vehicles, I'm, I'm pretty against. I think it's just a really fundamentally a human factors problem. Um, and I don't know how you have this mixed system where the human is the fallback and how you keep that person engaged and trained. There's the fully autonomous vehicle. It's like the stuff in, that Google and others are doing. Um, there's a lot of exciting problems to be had here. And right now, some of the trade-off we're making was reducing speed, right? We're thinking about 25 miles per hour where now the sensing is actually um, sees far enough into the distance that from a planning horizon, right, I can see far enough. If you take a, your standard Velodyne LiDAR and you try to use this on a highway where you have closing velocities, right, the range on a standard LiDAR is insignificant. It, it's, too, it's too short. It's just a couple seconds of awareness. I think another area that, where we could potentially have a lot of impact is what I like to call um, bumper bowling. Basically, the idea is that if we're really concerned with the safety aspect of this, not necessarily the social convenience aspects of cars as a service, but if it's really the safety, if we want to bring down the number of fatalities. 
keeping the human artificially engaged that they never tune out of the system. They're always driving, right? But the car is there, more from the active safety paradigm, ready to step in and prevent you from doing the stupid thing, right? Doing that lane change into that blind spot where you don't see something there. I think right now we talk about one fatality per 100 million miles driven. I think within a decade, if we were really push a lot of our energy into this space, it's conceivable we might be able to push that to one fatality per billion miles driven, right? We can make a lot of progress. The question is who wants to pay for that? And this is a question for society, right? Right now we talk about there's so, this is such a hot market because it's cars as a service. It's this new economy thing, right? It's not safety. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, I think another key to this will be testing venues like M-City in the sense that, you know, we can talk about miles driven, okay, uh, in terms of testing these cars on public roadways and whatnot. But the problem is, is, are those statistically meaningful miles in terms of having to deal with the corner cases, right? The really aggressive, uh, weird and wacky things that, individually, they're rare events, but collectively, they're common. They happen all the time. So the idea behind M-City, this is not a replacement for on-road testing, this is a supplement. With M-City, we get to be maximally evil to the technology. And the hope is with venues like M-City, maybe for every kilometer driven in M-City, maybe that scales to 10, 100, or 1,000 kilometers of real-world driving in terms of our ability to statistically pack in hard braking events, you know, red lights changing in an unexpected way, mechanized pedestrian testing, you know, stuff that would not be reasonable to do in an on-roadway kind of testing environment, but to give you this ability to to get some statistical significance on hard miles. So in summary, I think the potential for automated vehicles is great. I think the idea has been overhyped, though, uh, in the media and the public's mind in terms of where the technology is really at in terms of nationwide all-weather driving. Uh, U of M's you know, making a big investment in the space with M-City and MTC. And I think human factors, along with rigorous testing and validation, are going to play a crucial role in really how we think about bringing this technology to market. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. So, so in this public-private partnership, it's, it's not just the university taking this on, but we are, uh, through this engagement with industry, obviously able to tap into um, matching or contribution funds from them that we can use toward this pool of research. I think the university is taking this on from the impact on society. Um, and really, this is a hard problem. And if we want to keep academics engaged in this problem, you know, when I tried to, to work in this space, just if I just go back three years ago, right, and when I first started this NGV project in 2012, if I talked to any of my colleagues, they said, you're crazy. Why are you trying to take on Google? And we're not, right? We're just trying to identify that there's a lot of still hard problems that fundamentally need to be solved here. And that at the time, really, it was hard to get like NSF funding or anything to do this kind of stuff, right? Your only outlet really was to do this through industry. So I think the fact that we have, we've created this ecosystem in Michigan of the academia industry, and now we've also got the eye of like USDOT and the Federal Highway Administration in terms of trying to have federal dollars come into this as well. I think we have the right partnership there that we can actually do, take on large scale kind of projects uh, in this space. And I, of course. So yeah, I think the university considers this an investment. So earlier in the talk, you, you made it clear that, that you agree that uh, the, the state of the art in autonomous vehicles can't parse novel environments. And then we can't have fully autonomous vehicles unless you have a vehicle that can parse novel environments, which means we can't do it. So what, how do we, how, given that, how do we as roboticists funded by eventually the public handle the bubble pop that's going to happen? The yeah, so just, I, let me just stay back your question so I make sure I answer the right way. So you said, I talked about earlier about how we can't fundamentally parse novel roads. And just novel environments. Like and novel environments. And, and then um, ultimately we can't have self-driving cars unless we're able to do that. Because at some point your map's going to change or it's going to be something different. You yeah, know. yeah. And there's a blind eight-year-old in the car. Yep. Um, so it's not that we can't parse novel roads, I, just, I think we're not able to do it with the level of reliability that we would need for these production systems. And that using the 3D prior maps, right now it's kind of a crutch that allows us to push up the reliability aspect of this. I think 
how we use these prior maps and, and, and maintain them, it seems like an insurmountable problem, but it's, it's one also where there, there's a lot of interest and where people smell money, they will try to figure out solutions. So for instance, we all, you've probably heard of like Nokia here or TomTom Tom are producing, they're doing exactly this, right? They're driving around with vehicles very much like what we have equipped, digitizing all of our roadways. Now, there's some effort that goes into the initial base mapping that goes with this. I'm hopeful, though, that the, the, how do you maintain these maps, right? Is that it, it's some mix of survey vehicles that would be going through the environment kind of update them. But also, as we have agents in the network that are using these maps for the automated driving capability with their sensing suite, that they become data probes themselves. And that in, through connectivity, right, with the, the cloud, right, we talk about the cloud, being able to push that data back up into the network in terms of I detected this anomaly, Right? We can do some reasoning about it, maybe update the map and push that back out to the network. And it's not like the car can't, doesn't have the capability to drive novel roads. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, we have to deal with construction zones, for instance, right? Things are going to pop up where the car has to be able to handle the situation. It's the idea that in terms of getting that reliability, oftentimes we're able to use that prior to our advantage so that we expect the expect and then can re reason about what's different and what's going on and kind of focus that. that. There's still going to be situations that require a human level understanding of this situation, that's what you Yeah, well, so, I, yeah, so when we talk about nationwide all, all about the driving, I think, yeah, there's yeah. fundamental challenges still here that need to be solved, right? And which we don't see a path, I don't see a path to solve. I think, it, yeah, so I think it's still decades off. Right, so, but how do we, how do we deal with the fact that people expect it tomorrow, and there's gonna be some kind of... Yeah, so I think it's gonna have to be some kind of fleet deployments in, in certain selected areas where it's gonna be a, a geo-fenced kind of service, right? It's gonna meet certain assumptions, maybe it's gonna be in good weather portions of the country like Austin or the Bay Area, right, or whatever, you have it, but maybe the autonomy actually gets enabled or disabled depending on weather, right? I think, I think there's proof of concept or maybe even like some financial financially viable deployments of this technology, but it's going to be under certain scenarios where the assumptions can kind of be met. So hopefully we can educate the public that it's really stupid? Yeah, I don't know. So this is the concern that I have. I mean, this experiment that Tesla is doing right now by pushing this out, Google did the same experiment in private about three years ago. If you ever hear Chris Ermson talk about this, right, they did the, what they call the dog food experiment at Google. They had about 100 of their Lexuses. They gave them out to their employees. These are highly trained software engineers at Google, and they said this is beta software. You are, a, you are a safety driver behind the wheel, right? You need to be ready to grab the wheel and pay attention. They instrumented the interior of the, of, the, of the cab so they could understand the human interaction, what they were doing. And what they found, they were shocked. Basically, the, very quickly, people, these intelligent engineers, right, quickly learned to trust the system too much. They would be reaching in the back seat, grabbing their briefcase, looking in the mirror, fixing their hair, or doing makeup, or whatever, right? And this is when Google essentially did a rethink. Right? If you notice, this is kind of the time frame when they said, we, this is not a product as it is. This is their whole motivation for the pod cars that you've seen where they want to remove the steering wheel. This is an easier problem, they feel, to go fully automated and remove the human machine interaction aspect of this. So, yeah, so I think there'll, there'll be deployments of this, but it's going to be under certain scenarios. Oh. Yes? You go and you map these environments, they're always parked cars yeah. and things that are sort of not permanent. Yep. How do you, do you as humans remove those features or how do you remove those features? Uh, uh, we do a couple things. Uh, we're, we're, we're not behind, we're not beyond, behind or beyond the, uh, the, the level of, of thinking about driving the road at 3 a.m., uh, which helps a little bit. Um, also, when we make multiple sweeps, so, so yeah, if we map it once and there's a static car parked there, it could end up in the prior map, but we try to do a ground plane model uh, uh, fitting, and so that allows us then to look where car-like objects are and basically exclude that region from the map. We don't have the information that's in the ground plane, but we basically have a silhouette or a cutout in our map of where that object, that static object might have been that's in the road. Um, and if we were to traverse it multiple times, we can think about trying to fix these maps. Um, so oftentimes when we drive the city, right, we're not just driving it from a single lane, but we'll drive it uh, in a mapping session and, and from multiple directions. And so in that case, if the cars have moved in that period of time, we're able to place that data in space. Yep, yes. I didn't see a single pothole in any of your videos. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sure, no, this is Michigan. They're everywhere. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it, it, that, that is a, an issue. I mean, that information can be annotated and, and put into the map. The yeah, LiDAR configuration. Can you talk about it now? No, yeah, well, yep. And actually, the LiDAR configuration we have is not great for sensing potholes, right? This, this kind of negative depression, the geometry is not that good for actually being able to sense that until you're right on top of it. Um, so, yeah, it's an issue. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Detroit's on a comeback, come on. Really? It is. There's, there's, there's people trying to move in, right, and like gentrify Detroit. Yeah. The what? The trolley problem? Oh. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, this is why this is MTC. We, we involve the, the philosophy people and like the people that, all, you know, right? Yeah, there's a lot of these questions in terms of, okay, what, who, how are you gonna write the algorithm to handle these situations, right? And you can, you can obviously construct uh, these situations where somebody has to die, right? And what's gonna happen? And I don't wanna tread into that. Um, but yeah, I guess these are some of the, the questions that we would need to ask, right, in terms of how we think about what we want to embed in terms of the decision making of these cars. Okay, is it good? Thank you.